We come now to Genesis chapter 49, where Jacob, the great patriarch of the family, whose name was also Israel, he will bestow a blessing upon his sons, which will turn out to be a prophetic announcement regarding the tribes of Israel. Let's remind ourselves of the scene. The entire family of Israel has moved to Egypt because of the great famine that has afflicted not only Egypt, but the entire region. And because of God's great work through Joseph, who ended up being a savior for the world, so to speak, through God's great work through Joseph, he provided grain for Egypt to survive this great time of famine, a seven-year famine that came upon the whole region. So, the family of Israel has moved from Canaan to Egypt to find refuge. They have a place of favor. Uh, Joseph is alive. He's second in command in the entire kingdom of Egypt under Pharaoh alone. And now Jacob, the patriarch of the family, again, remind yourself that Jacob and Israel are two names referring to the same person, this grandson of Abraham, this son of Isaac. Jacob now, knowing that his death is near, calls his sons around him and will prophetically pronounce a blessing upon each one of them, which does not concern them individually so much as it concerns them prophetically as a tribe. Here we go, verse 1 of Genesis chapter 49, verses 1 and 2. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. This calling together of his sons was Jacob's last significant act as a patriarch and as the heir to Abraham and Isaac. Never forget, God made a very specific and important covenant with Abraham. God promised Abraham a land, a nation, and a blessing. And that blessing would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, who would bring salvation for all the earth, all of those among the tribes of the earth that would trust in him. Abraham passed that covenant down to Isaac. Isaac passed that covenant down to Jacob. And now Jacob will prophetically uh, pronounce a blessing upon each son, representing each tribe one by one, because this covenant of Abraham is extended to them all, which is sort of interesting and significant. I mean, Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. The covenant only passed to one, Isaac. Uh, Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. The covenant only passed to one, Jacob. But with the sons of Jacob, the covenant is communicated to all 12 of those sons, and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. It's also interesting in verse 1 that Jacob says, What shall befall you in the last days? Now, what's fascinating about this is some of what follows are not so much blessings as they are prophecies regarding what God will do with these tribes in the future. And you could even say that when Jacob uses those words, what shall befall you in the last days, obviously he's speaking of things in the future. And this is the first conscious prophecy spoken by a man in the Bible. Now, there are several prophecies announced by God. Of course, you have the great promise of the triumph of the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent that that promise of god's deliverer for humanity way back in genesis chapter 3 verse 15 but that was a promise spoken directly by god there were other veiled prophecies that were spoken by men in other words, when Abraham says to Isaac, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided, uh, we, we don't know exactly if Abraham had a consciousness that he was speaking forward in time. He was by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but we, we're not sure if that was a conscious prophecy. What Jacob has to say here is the first declared prophecy through a man in the Bible. That makes it significant right there. According to Lewis Ginsburg, 
in his collection of books called The Legends of the Jews. Jewish traditions tell us that as Jacob was about to bless his sons, he was ready to tell them the great secret concerning the end of time. But at that moment, the glory of God visited, the Shekinah, and then it left just as quickly, taking all trace of the knowledge of that great mystery so that Jacob couldn't tell his sons the great secret concerning the end of time. Now again, that that didn't really happen. It's just an interesting legend. These rabbinic legends sometimes add a little bit of color, but really don't add much understanding to the text because they deal with fanciful recreations of things that never happened. Now, in verse 2, Jacob says to his sons, You sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. At the very beginning of this blessing that he's going to pronounce upon the sons and tribes of Israel, Jacob was conscious that he was both Jacob and Israel. Jacob, a name not very complimentary. It meant cheater, trickster, con man, uh, scoundrel, rogue, something like that. That's what the name Jacob meant. Israel was the name God gave him later, the name governed by God or prince with God. It's very interesting to see that sometimes this man, the son of Isaac, acted more like Jacob and sometimes he acted more like Israel. Here he uses both names in the same phrase. Verse 2, you sons of Jacob and listen to Israel, your father. You see, I, I guess you could say that he came to a place of spiritual maturity. He realized what God had made him, what God had made him was Israel. Uh, uh, again, governed by God, prince with God. A and also what he had to battle against, his fallen nature, his nature inherited from Adam, who he was, so to speak, in the flesh. And that would be Jacob. So now, beginning at verse 3, he's going to go son by son, tribe by tribe, and discuss and prophesy their future. Here we go, beginning now with the firstborn, Reuben, in verses 3 and 4. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might in the beginning of my strength, the excellence of dignity and the excellence of power unstable as water you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed then you defiled it he went up to my couch as the firstborn son of the family reuben had claim to the inheritance rights of the firstborn in many ways reuben should have been the preeminent the 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 the, the most um prominent son among all 12 but it can be said that Reuben forfeited his rights of the firstborn through his pride. Verse 3 mentions the excellency of your dignity. You're so consumed with your own dignity, you're filled with pride. But it wasn't only pride. He also forfeited the right of the firstborn through immorality. He says, you defiled it. And again, Reuben's immorality with his father's concubine Bilhah, who, by the way, was the mother of his brothers, Dan and Naphtali. That's recorded back in Genesis chapter 35, starting at verse 22. Because of these character flaws, his pride, his immorality, by implication of his lack of self-control, uh, in verse 4, Jacob says of Reuben, unstable as water, you shall not excel. You see, because of Reuben's instability, you could say that the birthright of the firstborn was taken from him. You see, usually the firstborn was the spiritual and social leader of the clan, but among of the sons of Israel, the rights of blessing, the right of priesthood, the right of ruling authority, they were taken from Reuben and divided among other brothers in the family. You could say the right of blessing was given to the tribe of Joseph, as we're going to see later, the two tribes that came from Ephraim and Manasseh. You could say that the right of priesthood was given to the tribe of Levi, uh, which became the priestly tribe, and, and the right of ruling authority, that was given to the tribe of Judah, as we'll see shortly. 
see, rather, all those things being centralized in one, as would be normal with the privileges of the firstborn, now they were divided among the brothers. You could say that even though we see the great wisdom of God in decentralizing this authority among the sons of Israel, not putting those combination of blessing, that combination of ruling authority, that combination of priesthood, instead of putting them all together in one tribe, God separated those powers. He distributed those responsibilities among different tribes in Israel. Reuben paid a very high price price for his instability you know more than anything god looks for stable godly character in those who will lead his people if you aspire to be a leader among the people of god give great attention to your character R remember what it says in the letters of the new testament in first timothy and in titus where paul is listing the qualifications for those who would aspire to be elders or leaders or pastors in god's church those characteristics all have to do with character not fundamentally with giftedness. Uh, Paul's word to the early church was, find the most gifted, charismatic guys you can find. No, that wasn't it at all. Just find men of character to lead the people of God. Reuben lacked this character. Therefore, it was said of him in verse 4, again, Jacob speaking prophetically, you shall not excel. The tribe of Reuben never did excel. No prophet, no judge, no king that we know of came from the tribe of Reuben. Reuben is an example of how the first can be last. Do you remember that in Matthew chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus said, uh, many of the last will be first and the first will be last? Well, there's a sense in which Reuben was a first who became last. I like what Charles Spurgeon had to say about this, that great preacher of Victorian England. I'll be quoting him several times through this examination of Genesis chapter 49 because uh, Spurgeon had some excellent things to say on these different blessings of the tribes. But regarding Reuben, Spurgeon observed this. He said, so a man may have great opportunities and yet lose them. Uncontrolled passions may make him very little who otherwise might have been great. Uh, that's a good word about this man, Reuben. Now, in verses 5, 6, and 7, there's going to be a blessing or a prophecy given over two sons, over two tribes, Simeon and Levi. Here we go, starting at verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel." Reuben was the firstborn son. He was considered in verses 3 and 4. Now in verses 5, 6, and 7, we deal with the secondborn and the thirdborn sons, Simeon and Levi. Now, Simeon and Levi received the same prophetic words over them, over their tribes. Why? Because they were both significant participants in the same evil deed. Way back in Genesis chapter 34, they were, as Jacob uses the phrase here, instruments of cruelty when they wiped out all the men of Shechem in retaliation for the rape of their sister Dinah. Again, that's back in Genesis chapter 34, beginning at verse 25. When Simeon and Levi committed this great crime, again, massacring an entire, the men of, all the men of entire city, in retaliation for the rape of their sister Dinah. Yes, Dinah was sinned against, and yes, there was punishment deserved, but what they did was so far in excess that it was an injustice in itself. Now, at the time, Jacob, probably in weakness, did nothing except register a small self-centered complaint. That's in Genesis chapter 34, verse 30. You know, you, you've made things difficult for me, basically, he said. 
Yet Jacob remembered this event. More importantly, the Lord remembered this event. It had happened more than 20 years before, yet the Lord remembered it. By the way, this illustrates a principle that the sins of one's past can come back and haunt them. Even when those sins are forgiven, those sins may carry consequences that perhaps will be faced for a lifetime. That was the situation here for Simeon and Levi. And in speaking to them, Jacob says in verse 7, Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce. You see, the real problem with Simeon and Levi was that their anger, verse 6 describes, in their anger they slew a man. Actually, it was many men. Their anger was sin because it was rooted in self-will. Verse 6 says, in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. You know, the Bible does speak of a godly anger. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, be angry and do not sin, saying that the two can go together. There can be an anger that is not of sin. But the Bible also speaks of ungodly anger. Later on in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, the Apostle Paul wrote, let all bitterness, wrath, anger be put away from you. And often, the difference between a godly, righteous anger and an ungodly anger is self-will. It's pride. It's, it's a self-desire and self-determination. That was certainly the case for Simeon and Levi. And as a punishment, so to speak, upon them, Jacob pronounces this prophetic word over these men and their tribes. Verse 7, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now, this is very interesting. The same prophecy was given over both men, over both tribes. They would both be scattered in Israel. And this prophecy of being divided and scattered, it's so interesting. It turned out to be a curse for Simeon, and it turned out to be a blessing for the tribe of of Levi. Let me explain. As it turned out, the tribe of Simeon was the weakest numerically of the 12 tribes. Uh, Numbers chapter 26, the second census taken in the wilderness, shows them to be a very small tribe relative to the other tribes. And we see in Joshua chapter 19 that when the land of Canaan was divided up among the tribes, there's a very real sense in which Simeon did not receive their own allotment. The cities that were given to Simeon were cities within the tribal allotment of Judah. Simeon was absorbed into the land allotment given to the tribe of Judah. They were scattered in Judah. You could say that the tribe of Simeon became small during the wilderness wanderings. They started out from Egypt being the third largest tribe. And listen, third largest tribe among all 12 tribes, that's pretty significant. That's in Numbers chapter 1, verse 23 that records that. But some 35 years later, at the second wilderness census of Israel, 63% of the tribe of Simeon had perished. And then they were the smallest tribe. So therefore, this prophecy that Jacob pronounced over them, again, verse 7, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. It was a curse for Simeon, but it was a blessing for the tribe of Levi. Because of the faithfulness of the tribe of Levi during the rebellion of the golden calf, that's in Exodus chapter 32, the tribe of Levi was scattered throughout the whole land of Israel, but as a blessing they received no large tract of land, such as the other tribes. They didn't receive a tribal province or state. But God said to the tribe of Levi, I am your inheritance, and I'll scatter you throughout Israel as a godly influence, giving you cities distributed throughout all the nation of Israel. So, dear brother or sister, please think about this. Both Simeon and Levi were scattered, but one as a curse and the other as a blessing. To quote Charles Spurgeon again here, he says this, 
uh, applying it to the life of the believer today. He says, happy is that man who, though he begins with a dark shadow resting upon him, so lives as to turn even that shadow into bright sunlight. Levi gained a blessing at the hand of Moses, one of the richest blessings of any of the tribes. It was the American author Washington Irving who said, it lightens the stroke to draw near to him who handles the rod. When the believer suffers from their sin, they should draw near to God and anticipate that God in his mercy will turn suffering into blessing. That's what happened with the tribe of Levi. And the same principle or pattern is often seen among the people of God today. Which brings us to verse 8. Verses 8 through 12, Jacob is going to speak over Judah, uh, which in some senses turns out to be the most important tribe. You'll see why here. Starting at verse 8 here in Genesis chapter 49. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion and as a lion who shall rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. So starting at verse 8, Jacob addresses Judah. And we sort of picture the, the sons of Israel gathered around the bed of Jacob and him going one by one. And I don't know if he moves strictly in a circle. So far, he's gone in birth order. Uh, Reuben, the firstborn, Simeon and Levi, second and third, and now Judah, the fourth born of the sons. But pretty soon, he's going to disrupt that order and go in a different order. But now in dealing with Judah, the first thing he says in verse 8 is this, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Now, as a man, Jacob's son Judah wasn't a completely good example of godly character. Matter of fact, when the brothers decided they were going to kill Joseph and they threw him in the pit so that they could eat a meal before they killed him, Jo J excuse me, Judah was the one who suggested let's sell Joseph and make a little money off of him. He, he can live and be a slave and we'll make some money off of it. So he was the one who suggested a profit motive in getting rid of Joseph. That's back in Genesis chapter 37. Judah was the one who did not deal faithfully with his daughter-in-law Tamar. That's back in Genesis chapter 38. And in the same chapter, Judah had sex with his daughter-in-law, thinking she was a prostitute. However, there was a significant transformation in Judah. When the sons of Jacob came to Egypt to buy grain and met with Joseph, even though they didn't know it was Joseph, but Joseph knew it was his brothers, in that whole drama that enacted with them over several chapters, Judah showed good character when he interceded and offered himself as a substitute for Benjamin. That's in Genesis chapter 44. Now, overall, the blessing given to Judah is an example of the richness of God's grace to the undeserving. If God were to focus and highlight Judah's failings, he'd say, well, I have no great blessing for you. But in his graciousness, God saw the repentance of Judah and restored him. You see, in a powerful way, this prophecy over Judah is a description of the greatest descendant that came from the tribe of Judah. And of course, that is Jesus 
Christ. To quote Charles Spurgeon once again, the dying patriarch was speaking of his own son Judah, but while speaking of Judah, he had a special eye to our Lord, who sprang from the tribe of Judah. Everything, therefore, which he says of Judah, the type he means with regard to our greater Judah, the antitype, our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, when Jacob spoke to Judah and said in verse 8, you are he whom your brother shall praise. In verse 9, that he would be as a lion. In verse 10, that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. And then later on in verse 10, to him shall be the obedience of the people. Each one of these phrases refer to the ruling position Judah would have among his brethren. You could say that while Levi inherited the priesthood, the sons of Joseph inherited sort of the material blessing, Judah received the ruling position that commonly went to the firstborn. He inherited this leadership aspect of the firstborn's inheritance. And this leadership position among his brothers would mean that the eventual kings of Israel would come from the tribe of Judah. And more importantly, that the Messiah, God's ultimate leader, would eventually come from the tribe of Judah. Think about it, friends. Of all the sons of Israel, the Messiah was going to come forth only from one of them, and it would turn out to be Judah. That's why in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, combining two images from this passage, Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Again, a very direct reference to this. I like what James Montgomery Boyce said about this. He said, the firstborn normally had two rights. First, he became the leader of the family, the new patriarch. Secondly, he was entitled to a double share of the inheritance, receiving twice as much as any of the other brothers. So you could say Joseph received the inheritance right, but it was uh, Judah that received the leadership right. And then in this prophecy, about Judah and his tribe and this ultimate descendant of Judah, Jacob used an interesting phrase in verse 10. He says, until Shiloh comes. Now, this prophecy of a leader from the tribe of Judah took some 640 years to fulfill in part with the reign of David. David was the first of Judah's dynasty of kings, and that prophecy took some 1,600 years to completely fulfill in Jesus. You see, here in verse 10, using that cryptic phrase, until Shiloh comes, the Messiah, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, is referred to as Shiloh. The, the name means, he whose right it is or to whom it belongs. And that's a title that is anciently understood to speak of the Messiah. And if you think about it, from the time of David, even until the time of the Herods, you know, King Herod in New Testament times, from David until the Herods, there was in some respect a prince of Judah who was head over Israel. Even in captivity, Daniel was of the tribe of Judah, and there's a sense in which he was head over his people. And the promise was that Israel would keep this scepter, mentioned in verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. And it could be said that even under their foreign masters during this period, Babylon, Persia, Greek, and the Romans, even under their foreign masters, Israel had some limited right to self-rule until about the year A.D. 7. At that time, under the descendants of the family of Herod and the Romans, the right to capital punishment was taken away from the Jewish people in Judea. Admittedly, that was a small element of their self-governance, but it was what remained. That was taken away. And it is said that at the time, AD 7, the rabbis considered this a disaster of unfulfilled scripture. 
Seemingly, according to the rabbis at that time, the last vestige of the scepter that Judah was to hold had passed from Judah, and they could not see that the Messiah was there. Reportedly, at that time, 87, the rabbis walked, or some rabbis, walked the street of Jerusalem and said, Woe unto us, for the scepter has been taken away from Judah, and Shiloh has not come. But friends, God's word had not been broken. Because you know who was alive in AD 7? Jesus. And perhaps the, the chronology of this can be a little bit confused, but perhaps this was the very year when Jesus was 12 years old and was discussing God's word in the temple with the scholars of his day. Perhaps Jesus impressed him with his understanding of this very issue. So this rich messianic prophecy connected to the tribe of Judah means that as Revelation chapter 5 verse 5 says that Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now there's also a mention in verse 11 of the great 11 and 12 of the great material prosperity that would come to the tribe of judah it speaks of binding his donkey to the vine that the vines are going to be so rich and strong that you could use them to you know hold an animal that the blessing upon judah did not only contain the promise of the messiah of the royal line to be resident with the tribe of judah but also a description of their material abundance by the way judah's land was and still is today great wine growing country <laughs> now in verse 13 jacob addressed the tribe of zebulun he says here in verse 13 zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea he shall become a haven for ships and his border shall adjoin sidon Jacob now skipped the birth order he went through the first four uh, reuben simeon levi judah but now he's skipping over to the 10th born and the 9th born sons. But he's keeping his focus on the sons that were born from Leah. And here addressing Zebulun. The tribe of Zebulun was later noted for its faithfulness to King David. They supplied the largest number of soldiers to David's army of any single tribe. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 33 says this, Of Zebulun there were 50,000 who went out to battle, expert in war with all weapons of war, stout-hearted men who could keep ranks. It's also said of Zebulun here prophetically, verse 13, that he shall become a haven for ships. Now I want you to notice this. Here, Jacob already has his mind prophetically on their return to the promised land. It wasn't going to happen for some 400 years, but Jacob knew it would happen. By covenant, God had promised that land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their covenant descendants, and that promise would be fulfilled. So he's speaking prophetically about the land that the people of Israel would have, even though it wouldn't be for 400 years. Now, I don't know that Jacob understood that it was 400 years, but I think he sensed it would be a long time. Therefore, he says in verse 13, speaking of Zebulun's allotment of land later in Canaan, he shall become a haven for ships. The tribe of Zebulun seems to have settled the piece of land sitting between the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea of Galilee. So literally, that phrase, shall dwell by the haven of the sea, can be translated, he will be looking towards the sea. And you could say that the tribe of Zebulun looked towards the sea, both to the east and to the west. They saw the sea on both sides, the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea of Galilee. Now, verses 15, or excuse me, 14 and 15, uh, Jacob is going to address the tribe of Issachar. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. In calling Issachar a strong donkey in verse 14, it was true that Issachar later became a large tribe. It was third in size among the tribes of Israel according to the Numbers chapter 26 census. But verse 15 also says that Issachar, this large tribe, this strong donkey, so to speak, would become a band of slaves. 
Because of the size and the abundance found among the tribe of Issachar, they were often targets of oppressive foreign armies who put them into servitude. Therefore, they became a band of slaves. The commentator Leopold says, The meaning seems to be that Issachar was strong, but docile and lazy. He would enjoy the good land assigned to him, but would not strive for it. Therefore, he would be pressed into servitude and the mere bearing of burdens for his masters. Coming now to verses 16, 17, and 18, the tribe of Dan. Jacob said, Dan shall judge his people. As one of the tribes of Israel, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. Now we'll deal with that interesting last phrase in a moment. But notice what Jacob said about Dan. He said, verse 16, that Dan shall judge his people. And it was true. The tribe of Dan did judge his people. They supplied one of the most prominent of the judges, and that is Samson. Judges chapter 13, verse 2 tells us that Samson was from the tribe of Dan. But he wouldn't just judge his people. By the way, the word Dan, name Dan, means judge. But in verse 17, he also says, Dan shall be a serpent by the way. Now, right right away, you read that and you have the sense, that doesn't sound good. A serpent by the way, a viper by the path. Those don't sound like good things. And there's a sense in which they weren't. It could be said that Dan was a troublesome tribe. They introduced idolatry into Israel, according to Judges chapter 18, verse 30. Jeroboam set up one of his idolatrous golden calves in Dan. That's in 1 Kings chapter 12. And later, Dan became a center of idol worship in Israel, according to Amos chapter 8, verse 14. Now, there are some people, I'm not going to say this is conclusive, I'm just telling you this as a suggestion. Some people think that the reference to a serpent by the way, or a viper in the path, refers to the idea that the Antichrist would come from the tribe of Dan. There's some indication of that based in Daniel chapter 11, verse 37, based in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 16, but I don't think it's enough to be conclusive. It's merely suggestive. But it is interesting to see that later on in the book of Revelation, when the tribes of Israel are listed regarding the 144,000, Dan is left out of that tribal list. It's fascinating. By including the tribe of Levi, the tribe of Dan is excluded so that it's 12 tribes. So it's left out of the listing of tribes of the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7, but Dan is the first tribe listed in Ezekiel's, what I would consider to be his millennial roll call of the tribes in Ezekiel chapter 48. I think that's a remarkable sign of God's redemption. Now, did you see that interesting line at the end of verse 18? After giving this somewhat heavy prophecy about the tribe of Dan, a serpent, by the way, a viper in the path, trouble's going to come from one of these tribes. At the end of that, Jacob utters an expression. He says, I've waited for your salvation, O Lord. That seems to be a parenthetical statement, not really properly part of the prophecy about Dan, but as if he has to pause for a moment and call out for God's salvation. I've waited for your salvation, O Lord. And I would suggest to this, whether Jacob knew it or not, he probably didn't, Jacob called out for Jesus Christ. I like what Spurgeon had to say about this. He had to say, What a happy breathing space this is. When you and I are also near our journey's end, may we be able to say, as Jacob did, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Now, why do I say I've waited for your salvation? Well, because the Hebrew word for salvation here is Yeshua which from that word comes the name Yahshua, the name Joshua, or Jesus. 
When he says, I've waited for your salvation, there's a sense in which he's saying, I've waited for Jesus. I've waited for Yeshua, the Savior you will send. That's a great attitude of heart for every believer. Now, verse 9, Jacob's going to briefly deal with Gad. Excuse me, verse 19, he's going to deal with the tribe of Gad. He says this, Gad, a troop, shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. So verse 19's reference to Gad, uh, well, later on we see that the tribe of Gad did supply many fine troops for the later king of Israel, David. You'll find that in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 14. Yet it also says, a troop shall tramp upon him. In the days of Jeremiah, perhaps among um, other, other times as well, foreign armies oppressed Gad. You'll see that in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 1. Yet, victory would be to the tribe of Gad in the end. He shall triumph at last. Isn't that a beautiful legacy for every child of God? Uh, often afflicted, having to fight. It, it's a spiritual battle that we engage until the very end. But with the power of Jesus Christ with the believer, he shall triumph at last. As it was said of Gad, so it shall be said of the believer who's in Christ. Now, verse 20, the tribe of Asher. Bread from Asher shall be rich. He shall yield royal dainties. It's interesting. Later on in Deuteronomy chapter 33, Moses is also going to pronounce blessings over the tribes. And he will once again take up this prophecy regarding Asher. This is what Moses said about Asher in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 24. Asher is most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers and let him dip his foot in oil. Again, the idea is of uh, material abundance, plenty of food to eat, even good food. Verse 20 says, he shall yield royal dainties. Uh, eventually, the land that was eventually occupied by Asher was good enough to bring not only necessities, but also luxuries, royal dainties. Verse 21 refers to the tribe of Naphtali. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Uh, this reference in verse 21 to Naphtali reminds us that Naphtali's land, as it was later distributed in the book of Joshua to the tribes of Israel, it was in a key portion near the Sea of Galilee, the region where Jesus did much of his teaching and much of his ministry. By the way, this is referred to, if I could read to you a few verses from Matthew chapter 4 right here. It says this, Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. It's something wonderful and connected to the beautiful words. Because so much of the ministry of Jesus took place in the region of Naphtali, this was fittingly spoken of this tribe. Of course, Jesus being the greatest teacher ever, speaking the most beautiful words, he did a lot of his ministry in the tribal allotment given to Naphtali. No wonder Jacob prophetically said he uses beautiful words. Now, starting at verse 22 through verse 26, we get to the tribe of Joseph. Jacob is going to address the tribe of Joseph, which is really two tribes. Now, back earlier in Genesis chapter 48, we discussed how there was a blessing put upon Manasseh and Ephraim, the two sons of Joseph. But here, Joseph is addressed as a individual son, but there were two tribes under Joseph. So, considering that, let's start now. Genesis chapter 49, verse 22, and I'm going to read all the way through verse 26. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. 
The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him, but his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your Father who will help you, and the Almighty who will bless you, with the blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lie beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your Father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph, and on the crown of his head of him who was separate from his brothers. This prophetic uh, word over the two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, that would come from Joseph, begins with the declaration of verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bough. This was both a description of Joseph's life, but then a personal blessing concerning his descendants. In a sense, Joseph's tribes were already blessed when his sons received the blessing that was given to them back in Genesis chapter 48. But this description of Joseph, as, as it says in verse 22, a fruitful bough by a well, that speaks of him being well watered and provided for in his deep and real relationship with God. To quote Spurgeon again, again, he's got excellent work on this chapter. Spurgeon said this, the main point in Joseph's character was that he was in clear and constant fellowship with God, and therefore God blessed him greatly. He lived to God and was God's servant. He lived with God and was God's child. Now, this was despite the fact of what is spoken in verse 23, that the archers have bitterly grieved him. Though Joseph was shot at and hated, he was still a fruitful branch. Why? I think the reason's given in verse 24. Uh, listen to this phrase from verse 24. The arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. The idea here is that, metaphorically speaking, God's hands were on Joseph's hand, giving him the skill and the strength to work the bow expertly. Imagine a child holding a bow, you know, a bow and arrow, and drawing it back like this, but the child's hands are a bit weak and doesn't have the skill required. So what does the father do? The father comes back behind the son and puts his hands on the son's hands, and it's his hands that strengthen and give skill to the hands of the son as he draws back the bow ready to shoot the arrow. Friends, God was there present with Joseph, strengthening his hands even in the pit, even sold as a slave to the Midianites, even sold as a slave to Egypt, even in Potiphar's house, even unjustly accused, even there uh, in prison and, and, and ill-treated in prison. In all of those things, God reached his arms around Joseph and said, let me give you my strength. Dear child of God, it's that way for the believer today. God is with you even when you don't sense it. Don't rely on the sense of God's premise, pro, presence to believe the promise of his presence. Well, that's how it was with Joseph. It's also said of Joseph here in verse 25, the Almighty who will bless you. And Joseph was certainly blessed in his descendants. The tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh were some of the most populous tribes of the, the whole nation of Israel. And in this sense, you could say that Joseph received the material blessing, the double portion aspect of the inheritance of the firstborn. So, Joseph and his tribes received the material aspect. You could say that the tribe of, Risa, of Levi received the spiritual aspect, and the tribe of Judah received the rulership or the leadership aspect. Verse 26, 
The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors. It's if right there, Jacob pauses for a moment and says, I'm not going to talk about Joseph. I'm going to talk about me and me, your father. I have been so blessed. I've been blessed beyond my ancestors. And Jacob could say this because for much of his life, he was a scoundrel, a rascal, someone not of good character and reputation. But now, at the end of his days, Jacob saw just how good God had been to him. In Luke chapter 7, verse 47, Jesus said, He who is forgiven much loves much. And friends, that, that's a verse that could be written over the life of Jacob. He wasn't, by his character in most of his life, a very good man. But he was humble before God, especially at the end, and he knew he had been forgiven much. Therefore, he loved the Lord much. Dear child of God, if you understand how much you've been forgiven by God, you will love him so greatly. I, I think it's also significant in verse 24 that Jacob mentions the mighty God of Jacob. You see, in his words about Joseph, in really just two verses, verses 24 and 25, Jacob listed five great names for gods. And these titles shows that Jacob did come to a profound understanding of who God is. He knew him, not, not only by words with these titles, but by experience. Therefore, he can call him, verse 24, the mighty God of Jacob. Verse 24, the shepherd. Verse 24, the stone of Israel. Verse 25, the God of your father. Verse 25, the Almighty. You know, this is so much better than earlier, back in Genesis chapter 31, when Jacob referred to God as the God of Abraham, or, or the fear of his father Isaac. You see, this indicates, using these five wonderful titles, the mighty God of Jacob, the shepherd, the stone of Israel, the God of your father, the Almighty, those great titles used in verses 24 and 25, this demonstrates that Jacob knew who God was for himself. Do you know that? L listen, if you had a godly grandparent who was an influence of your life, Praise the Lord for that. But their faith, their relationship with God can't rescue you. You need your own relationship with God. But maybe you had a godly parent. Praise the Lord for that. What a gift that is. Their relationship with God can't make you right with him. You need to come to God yourself. And Jacob, knowing God in this way that he could uh, throw out with meaning these titles of the Lord, knew that he knew who God was in these ways, and he knew it for himself. Bringing us now, verse 27, to Benjamin. It says of Benjamin, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Benjamin was a tribe with a reputation for fierceness. And to see the great extent of that, here's some examples of men from the tribe of Benjamin. Ehud, in Judges chapter 3, a, a brutal man. Saul, who could be quite brutal himself. And Paul, the apostle, in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul, who, who was a violent, vicious man before his conversion. The one who would devour the prey. Later on, the cruelty of the tribe of Benjamin in general is seen in the book of Judges, chapter 19 and 20. Oh, yes, he was a ravenous, a, a uh, violent, fierce tribe. Now, in verse 28, we have Jacob concluding the blessing of the sons. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them, and he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. You know, some of the things mentioned regarding these tribes may seem a bit cloudy. How is this exactly fulfilled? But I, I want to suggest to you that we may not know their exact fulfillment until ages to come. But friends, I believe very strongly, I believe the Bible teaches this, that God is not finished with these tribes of Israel, that they still have a role in God's unfolding plan of the ages. So, so who knows if some of these cryptic suggestions, these prophecies of these tribes, might become clearer as God 
continues his great plan of the ages. Yet, nevertheless, it tells us that these blessings were given each one according to his own blessing. Each son and each tribe that would come from those sons had their own calling and destiny. Yet, the remarkable promise remains that these would all grow, they would all survive, number one, and that they would all grow into significant tribes. Not one of these sons or their descendants would perish during the centuries to come in Egypt. Twelve sons went in, twelve tribes came out. And friends, that's because of the hand of the Lord upon these covenant people. Verse 29 is going to begin the description of Jacob's death. Here we go. Verses 29 through 32. We're in Genesis chapter 49. Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. When Jacob says in verse 29, I am to be gathered to my people. He believed he was a saved man. Jacob was confident that his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham continued to live, that they were alive in the world beyond. They were in the eternal state and that he would be gathered to them. So therefore he said in verse 29, bury me with my fathers. Think about that for a moment. Don't bury me in Egypt. You see, even though Jacob was now in Egypt, and had lived in Egypt for, what, 17 years? The last 17 years of his life? At the same time, Jacob knew he was not an Egyptian. He was a son of the promise. He was an heir of the covenant that God made with Abraham and Isaac, and now that Jacob would pass on to his 12 sons. Therefore, Jacob asked to be buried in the land that was promised by covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. He says in verse 30, bury me in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah. And I can't help but remember that Egypt was filled with magnificent tombs. Yet, because of the respect that Jacob had through Joseph, his favored son, I believe that if he had desired it, if he had demanded it, Jacob could have been buried like a pharaoh. Maybe not with a pyramid, but with a magnificent tomb there in the land of Egypt. But rather, he says, put me in a cave. I would rather be buried in an obscure cave in Canaan because Canaan is the land that God promised to me, to my father Isaac, to my grandfather Abraham. Verse 33, And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. This ends the life of one of the last of the great patriarchs. You have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet praise the Lord, the work of God, the plan of God, did not end when Jacob died. Yes, he's the last of the patriarchs. Abraham is no more. Isaac is no more. Jacob is no more. But God's redemptive plan would continue through men to come, generations to come. Matter of fact, it says here, he only did this when he had finished commanding his sons. To quote Spurgeon once again, Jacob did not yield up the ghost until he had delivered the last sentence of admonition and benediction to his 12 sons. He was immortal till his work was done. So long as God had another sentence to speak by him, death could not paralyze his tongue. <laughs> but once he was finished, well, then he could pass from this life to the next. 
Verse 33 says that he was gathered to his people. I've read somewhere that there are three basic attitudes towards death. Among the ancient Greeks, they had what could be called the death-accepting view. Look, death is inevitable. Just accept it. There's nothing you can do. Just yield to it. I would say, in many ways, our modern world is sold out to the death-denying approach. <laughs> we don't really accept death, but we just deny it. We ignore it. We, we just think about death as little as possible. So there's death accepting, there's death denying, but friends, I want you to know I believe that the biblical approach is the death defying attitude that trusts in the victory of Jesus Christ over death and over the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? You've been conquered in Jesus Christ. Now, before we leave Genesis chapter 49, let's consider just a few ways that this chapter points to Jesus Christ. And again, if you think of more ways other than just a couple I'm suggesting right here, uh, we'd love to hear about it. But let me just suggest a few ways, two ways. Uh, first of all, there are many direct and powerful references to Jesus the Messiah in the prophecy that Jacob spoke over the tribe of Judah. So in verse 9, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, in verse 10, Jesus is the one who holds the scepter that belongs to Judah. In, in verse 10, Jesus is the lawgiver from the tribe of Judah. In verse 10, Jesus is Shiloh, he whose right it is, or you could say, to whom it belongs. He has the right, the authority. And in verse 10, Jesus is the one to whom the obedience of the people belongs. Yes, these glorious things were not spoken specifically of Judah himself, but of his greatest descendant, Jesus Christ. That's number one. Number two, even as Jacob blessed his sons, Jesus is the one who blesses his people with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Remember what it says there in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Isn't it beautiful? Jesus ascended to heaven, blessing his people, and he continues to bless them, even as Jacob blessed his sons. There's far greater, far more significant blessing found for the people of God in Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who holds the scepter, the lawgiver, Shiloh, the one to whom the obedience of the peoples belong. Father, thank you for this. Thank you that again and again you point to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because, Lord, as meaningful as it is to consider the sons of Israel gathered around his bread and, and how these things were uh, prophetically true of their tribal destinies, Lord, all this culminates in the greatest ever from Israel, Jesus Christ, the Messiah of God. We trust in him. We're grateful for the sacrifice that he offered, giving his life for us at the cross and triumphing over sin in death at the empty tomb of the resurrection. For it all, Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.